you already know that I'm coming from Germany and that I'm living in the north of Germany um, in the city of Kiel, which is um, about one hour north of Hamburg at the Baltic Sea. And that means we are already very close to Denmark. And Kiel is a very famous passenger port where you can get um, ships to uh, from Sweden and Norway. So it's a very lovely place and um, a nice area. In the beginning, I would like to say that I try not to go too much into details, but I have to go into some detail um, because especially when it comes to a little bit of um, privacy laws in Germany and also when it comes a little bit to historical information. So I hope you don't get confused and um, I try to avoid to talk not too long about that. So also please be aware that I'm actually talking about my own experiences. It can be that other professional genealogists had other experiences. So this is the overview of what we're going to do tonight. So you heard already a little bit about me. Then we're going to look at some general aspects. I will introduce some places where you can look for documents. I will talk a little bit about historical aspects. And uh, after that, I would like to share what I actually like to do when it comes to family research. And in the end, when there's time, I still want to give you some recommendations. So what will you actually expect when you're doing research on your family in Germany? First of all, we have to talk about the privacy laws. So Germany has a federal data privacy law. That means that everyone, if it is a person, a company or a state has to follow these rules, which actually were tightened in 2018 and equalized according to the European Union. So that means um, it is not allowed to just collect data uh, and um, to forward data to any third uh, person. So um, this is a little bit different than in the States where different branches often have different rules. And uh, sometimes you guys in America, you also have a little bit more easy access to uh, personal data. So in Germany, that is a little bit more complicated. So actually, for example, the state can only access my private data when um, there is a judge's instruction. Also, um, companies are not allowed to use my data only when I um, told them that I'm fine with them using my data. Regarding on family research, that means that you usually cannot get access to a person's private data except when you are related to that person or when you have a letter of attorney. Especially when you ask a researcher to do help, uh, but, and excuse me, especially when you ask a researcher to help you with your research, it's definitely a thing you need. So you should always talk about um, a letter of attorney and this is very important because when you go to uh, different places where you want to look for data, um, the person you, that is looking for you, the professional genealogist or someone else, uh, needs that letter of attorney to get access. Another big problem in Germany, some of you will experience this or have experienced that is the handwriting. So, well, nowadays we're all probably using modern script, but especially in Germany, that was not the fact for the last, well, let's say 500 years. So the handwriting has changed a lot. So at the moment, when you're searching for documents, you will face lots of different handwritings when you have a look at these old documents. 
first of all, there will be um, Sutterlin. So this is when we're going back in time from modern script. The next one will be Sutterlin, which is uh, a script which perhaps one or the other of your relatives uh, still have learned in school. It is a variation of the current writing. So um, Sutterlin is a writing which was invented by the Prussians in 1911, and it was later announced to be the only possible handwriting during the Third Reich, for example. But after the World War II, lots of people got back to the current writing. So the current, that is what the most, what is, yeah, what is the most used writing from the 16th to the 20th century. So with a little bit of experience, you should be able to read those documents. But as always, handwriting can be a mess, just like today. Of course, over the centuries existed lots of different current handwritings. So it is like with every writing, always a little bit difficult. And the last one is Kanzleischrift. That is similar to the current, but that was especially used for official documents. So that, mean, that means you've perhaps seen already documents, official documents, where there are big letters uh, in the beginning of a sentence, which do have like lots of bows and waves and um, lots of strokes, so that even these letters are very difficult to read. And uh, this is actually the Kanzleischrift. So this often makes it very difficult to read, um, especially when the print is poor. And um, the, the problem is that you often do not know where it starts and where it ends. And other different writings is, of course, everybody else has his own writing, so it can be very idiosyncratic and it can be very difficult to uh, see people's handwritings over the last centuries. Very important is actually where are places to look for documents. In Germany, you have like a civil register that is the German Standesamt. Perhaps you have heard of that. Then you have church books. And then you have archives, libraries. And of course, you have online libraries or online archives where you can find documents. The civil register or the civil registration, so the German Standesamt, this is actually where nowadays all strings of a life come together. So that means every German has to go to the Standesamt to report a birth, a marriage and a death of a person. In charge is always the Standesamt where you live. And um, especially the Standesamt where you live at the time of the event. So when I want to go and find my own birth certificate, I would have to go uh, and get in touch with the register office at my birthplace. So when I want to go and find my marriage certificate, I have to contact the Standesamt, the register office where I got married and so on. The Standesamt, so they are actually the places where all the um, documents are administrated. And yeah, all the, all the office clerks in the Standesamt, they are actually responsible for um, that there are like, um, that everything is fine and everything is in order and that there is not uh, a too big cause for uh, when you're looking for something. So actually this is where the German uh, bureaucracy comes from. Yeah, these Standesamts, um, you find them as a part of the city hall. So 
When you're looking for a record from a small village or a town, it could be that you will find register offices in the next bigger city. And actually, you will get a hint when you visit their web page or the web page of the next bigger city. So you just get in touch with them and they can actually tell you where to find it. Very important is that big cities like, for example, Berlin or Hamburg or Munich, they do have multiple Standesämter or multiple register offices. So um, it is very, very helpful to know where exactly a person was from and where. Uh, so you will get a hint where to find uh, the documents. Um, it can also happen that these uh, people in the Standesamt, they forward your request to an archive or let you know that they do not, that they do not have all the records. And then hopefully they point you in the right direction where to look next. So a lot are also stored in bigger archives, a lot of the documents. And it is always a challenge to find out if they are still if they are still in the register office or if they are already somewhere in an archive. Um, but actually, the easiest way is to ask all the staff who is working there and they will help you. The Prussian, well, you probably have heard of the Prussians. They invented the Standesamt. So um, the system with having a general registration started during the Prussian time. In 1871, the German Empire was created. So we had an emperor and um, suddenly a lot of small kingdoms and duchies and city states and church states, which were all on the land of the empire were put together and uh, they became one big empire under the reign of the Prussian emperor. And they started and began to register every person in their new state. So as you can guess, that is a really big task and is a very large bureaucratic act. So everyone was now obliged to get registered so that they had an overview of all their citizens. When you're lucky, you can find some older records from register offices, but this is actually only in areas which were occupied by French during the early 19th century, such as in Western Germany, like the Rhineland. And this is also just a period which was not very long, about 20 years. But that is, that is a part of the French uh, Court Civil. So the easiest way to get in touch with the Standesamt or the civil register is when you know the city where you want to look at, you, most cases you can find an email address or a contact on their web page. And um, they are actually, usually they're very helpful and they will uh, help you to find the documents or point you in the right direction. So in Germany, we do have three big types of certificates, which are actually the birth certificates, which are the marriage certificates and which are the death certificates. So when we're talking about birth certificates, you can see I have written here, there is a limitation period from 110 years. That means that um, when you're not related to a person and you're looking for the person's birth certificate, you can only get access to it when the person was born more than 110 years ago. Why 110 years? That was just um, a number because they were thinking of, okay, nobody is going to turn 110 years. And um, so that their privacy law is not um, touched in any case. Um, usually the birth certificate is a one pager. And 
information you can find on the birth certificates are actually really a lot. So besides the name of the child, you can also find the names of the parents. You can often find the professions of the parents. You can find uh, the addresses of the parents. And um, in some cases, you also uh, find witnesses like uh, the midwife or someone else. To show you the numbering of the certificates, uh, we are looking at an example. So the example I chose here, that is a birth certificate from the year 1894. And it was, um, it is from the city of Schweinfurt, which is in Bavaria in the south of Germany. And this is actually the birth certificate of one of my great grandfathers. And I have chosen that because this is a type of co um, current writing, which is quite okay to read because this person really had a very nice handwriting. So on the very top, you can see a number. Um, this number is actually uh, the number of the entrance into the registration. So when you have the year, like 1894, and you also have the number, like the 329 on the top, um, you can easily get access to this document. So you just um, have to get in touch with them and tell them, okay, I want to have the birth certificate with the number from uh, 329 from 1894. And then they can easily um, look for it in a book or in the archive and provide you with it. So these are some, or these are the official prints from the Prussian state. So there is already like uh, text printed and you just have to fill the gaps. So you can also see below the name that there is again a number, which is the number 43. This is actually um, just saying that they are living in Schweinfurt and they're living in the Naungasse 43, 43. And then it tells you also what kind of religion this person, this person had. This is a Protestant um, document at this point. And what is very interesting and very good is to see that for uh, the mother, there is also the birth name in it. So this can help you in your search for the history of the great grandmother or great great grandmother as well, because you know her birth name. Also, there are uh, what I find very interesting on the bottom. Um, you can see that there are two signatures. So the signature on the very top, uh, on the very bottom, that is actually the office clerk. And the signature on top of that, that is actually the signature of my great great grandfather. And I always find it very interesting when I find documents to even see their handwritings. On the very, very bottom, you can see that there is a stamp and that there is a date which uh, is from 1971. So this is actually a stem where it says that this person who was born here in Schweinfurt has actually died in April uh, 1971 in the city of Karlstadt. And it actually also tells us that there is a number 37. So that gives you actually a hint when you contact the city of Karlstadt and you ask for the death certificate, you have uh, already the number of the um, death certificate in the registration. So usually the 
um, register offices, um, do get in touch with the birthplace or the marriage place to exchange numbers. And when you're lucky, you find such stamps on these uh, documents, which I find is very, very interesting. The next certificate is the marriage certificate. And very interesting and very, very important here is that the limitation period is shorter. It's only 80 years. So that is because, um, well, they thought that nobody is going to be married for more than 80 years. And so you are able to uh, find uh, marriage certificates from nowadays counting back. So around up to 1940. And also very important here is that it is a two pager. To all you people who are actually using um, ancestry or family search or such, please make sure whenever you find a German marriage certificate, always turn over the page and look at the second page. Because on the first side, on the, on the first page, you actually find the number, uh, the, the name of the bride with their parents, the name of the groom with his parents. And on the right side, you actually find information to witnesses. And these witnesses very, very often are somehow related to bride or groom. I have also said here that there's also the numbering of certificate. This is the same on the next page. I just try to make it a little bit bigger. So, um, so this is actually the two pager. As you can see, the numbering again, there is a number right on top of the um, document. So this, when you know the year, which is here, 1928, and you know the number of the marriage certificate, you should easily find it in the archives of the city where these uh, two people were married. And this is actually, this, this is not a really good example for Sutterlin writing because this is actually a person who mixed everything a little bit up. So, there are letters which are very uh, Sutterlin, but there are also letters which are not. So this is actually a mixture of everything. Um, but I think it is quite okay to uh, read. And uh, on the very top, you can see that this uh, marriage was in Frankfurt, in Frankfurt. So, um, this is actually the person uh, from the birth certificate we saw before. This is my great-grandfather marrying my great-grandmother. And what is also very interesting, when you go to the number two, you see that the first word which was put in there um, says that my great-grandmother was uh, working in a hotel. And that made it that that was very interesting for me because I found out that she was also living in that hotel. So um, because they had the address of the hotel here as well. And when I was talking to my grandmother, um, she still knew that when I told her is that the hotel where she actually lived and worked, um, it was nice to know that that was the case. And on the right side, um, you can see that there are witnesses. Usually you have two witnesses in Germany. So here you can see both of them on the right side and you can even see um, how old they are and where they live and what they actually do for a work. Here it is just that they are um, workers. On the very bottom to the right, you can see that all four persons have uh, signed the document. 
So the bride with the new name and her birth name, the uh, groom and the two witnesses. The next thing is the death certificates. So here we have a limitation period from only 30 years, but I have made the experience that it is not very easy to get access to um, death certificates, which are just over 30 years old. So um, I don't know why that is, but um, sometimes it just takes longer until they put those documents into the archive so that you can get actually access to them. Again, this is a one pager. Um, you can usually find all the information on these documents as on the other documents before. So this is the name, this is perhaps where the person has lived. This is actually also who was the person who actually came to the office and got the information that uh, someone had died. And again, we do also have the numbers on the certificates. Here is the death, the death certificate. So this is actually not from that person now, but from the father of my great-grandfather. And um, he died in 1933, uh, 1932, sorry. And uh, you can also see on the top the number of the death uh, registration. Also, you have here that he was a worker, that he lived in Schweinfurt. You have the address where he has lived. And um, here it says that his, uh, that his mother came to, to uh, report. And on the bottom, again, you have the uh, signatures. Sometimes when you have death certificates from hospitals, um, you, well, probably you're not lucky, but it is, uh, it is a little bit of luck for the researcher because then you sometimes also uh, can find out what was the cause for the death. So, in these handwritten documents, in these handwritten death certificates, it's actually not always very obvious what was the cause for the death. So the only thing that they write in there is um, that the person who came and declared um, that someone was dead just said, okay, I have seen the corpus. So um, this is the only information, but when you, have the official document from the hospital, then there is always a line on the bottom where you can exactly see what the cause of the death was. And sometimes you're even more lucky because they usually use the typewriter. So it's actually a little bit easier to read it. So for the documents in Germany, it's always very important uh, to know what the limitation periods are. So the limitation period always apply to persons which are not related to the searched person in direct line. So when you are a direct relative or when you have a letter of attorney um, of the direct relative, you will usually also get access to the documents. When it comes to costs of search at the Standesamt, it's usually like that. So in general, looking into the registration or finding old documents is part of the job of people who work at the register office, but not everywhere this is a free service. So this can go from a couple of euros just to cover their costs of materials up to fixed prices for their work hours. So sometimes they charge you for 15 minutes, for 30 minutes or for 60 minutes, and that can pretty fast get quite expensive. To avoid a bad experience, I can only give the advice 
that you should always let them know that you're willing to pay for all the arising expenses. Because sometimes when you don't tell them in advance, they even do not bother and don't answer you. Also, ask them in advance what they take for the service or let them know a maximum amount up to which you're willing to pay. That is sometimes also helping them to well make them more willing to support you. That way you should be able to get what you want. And very important is also that the documents you are looking for nowadays uh, you are looking for a nowadays somewhere in a country that has been Prussian or German before World War II or World War I. So there are still documents existing, although there has been a lot of destruction. Um, altogether, when it comes to the German uh, register offices, then documents date back to 1876 or 1874. It just depends on where in Germany you're looking. And you have to keep in mind that um, Germany today was not the German speaking area of the Prussians like 100 or 120 years ago. So um, even when you're looking in Poland or in Czech uh, Republic or in Slovakia, you can find documents and you can even find these documents in German. Not all of the documents survived or sometimes not all of the documents are still there, but they're in other archives. But this is just like a little bit of a detective work. And it's, yeah, it's not always that easy, but it can be that you will find documents over there. And the last thing I can tell you is um, that you should be patient, especially now when we're having COVID at the moment, the searches for genealogical um, documents are actually pretty complicated. So the register offices, are just uh, working too much at the moment. So although this is part of their job, um, this is actually the last thing they are nowadays uh, interested in um, because they just have too many people who are ill at the moment. Or So just be patient because it is going to take really a little bit longer and at the moment, more often, there is only one person there who is in charge. And especially in times of COVID, this can really extend the search of your time. The next place where you can look for documents on your family are church books. As you probably know, we do have two big churches in Germany, um, which probably cover a very big part of the German families. So there is the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, and both keep records in their church books. And this is uh, important, especially for the time before the register offices. So church books were a very important part of having an overview of the community and definitely the most important before the existence of the register offices. But also there is the thing, the older the books are, the more difficult is the language they are written in. So it can be that they are written in German. Those are mostly the Protestant church books, or they are written in Latin, or in both. And those are mostly the Catholic church books. So what you can find there are records of baptisms, marriages, and funerals. Very important here is that baptisms is not the day of the birth, but usually like some days later. And the same with the funerals, it's not the actual um, date of the death, but mostly some days later, the date of the funeral. 
um, about other religions, for example, when we're talking about Jewish, um, you will be surprised, but sometimes you can even find Jewish births at um, Catholic or Protestant church books. But this is not always the case. So this is actually just because the priest in that village just recorded that there was a child born. And usually you can only, uh, you can also see in the church book that this wasn't a Catholic or Protestant child, but a child from another religion. Here's also the question where to find the church books. Well, as the name says, they obviously are to be found in churches and every German community or municipality usually has a parish office. And when you're lucky, they usually have one Catholic and one Protestant. And um, also you can find some of the church books online. And here again, if you do not find them in the village or the town you're looking for, just try to find them in the next bigger city. Also, uh, when you have very small parish offices, you can be also lucky to find them over there because they often still hold their own, their, their own church books and are not yet, for example, digitalized or archived yet. Sometimes you can also be lucky and find the church books in libraries because in some cities they just copied the church books and put them into their libraries. Most likely you will probably find them in the church archives or the state archives. There are two big overall online archives. So there is one for the Catholic Church, which is called Matricula, and that is actually with a free access. And then there's one for the Protestant Church, which is called Archion, and uh, that is unfortunately not for free and actually quite expensive. But um, there you can search also for church books. I even think at the Archion you can already search for the church books and see if they are there. And when you found them, you only have to pay for when you really want to see the document. And nowadays it is actually really important to check these online archives from uh, now and then because um, they're just getting more and more important and they're just getting more and more document. I was talking about the historical aspects we do have some barriers in Germany where the um, research is actually getting pretty difficult. So first of all, well, there is the division of Germany. So we had an eastern part and a western part. And especially in the eastern part, there got um, lots of documents lost um, because of the German Democratic Republic. Then we had the World Wars one and two. And that meant lots of destruction all over Europe. And so this is also uh, where we lost lots of um, historical documents. And actually the biggest barrier in Germany is the 30 years war. So usually you can say when you um, get back to the 30 years war, so like 1650, you can be very lucky because that is already a very good result of your research. In some cases, you can be very, very lucky and get even further back. But usually when we're talking about the German speaking area that was um, actually destroyed very much um, during these 30 year wars, so that there are not many uh, documents to be found from the time before. So how is it with the digitalization in Germany? The first thing you will realize very soon 
in your research is that German records are not as often digitalized as records in other countries. That actually brings us back to our first point, which was the data privacy. Um, I don't know if you have already been to Germany, but perhaps you have uh, recognized or realized that um, very many people pay cash. So they don't use a debit card or they don't use a credit card. That is actually also because of trying to avoid using these cards because they are afraid of IT crimes. And this is actually also the problem with the documents and the digitalization. So lots of um, register offices or lots of uh, church parishes, parish offices are afraid of IT crimes. And that's why it's just getting going on very slow to um, get these things all digitalized and put online. So most of the work in Germany is really taking place in the archive and you really have to go down there and you really have to look at the books and uh, try to find uh, the right document. And then that is actually a very interesting point. We can be very thankful for the Mormons because um, they have started to uh, photograph documents and files in Germany after the Second World War. And they actually are providing a big part of the German documents. And I think they are also doing uh, projects together with archives and together with parishes and cities to get more and more documents online. At the moment, there are lots of projects going on. If it is in big archives or uh, if it is from a city, but um, lots of um, cities or more and more documents are finding the way online so that it is also possible to get access to them from somewhere else and you don't have to go there and travel there and it just uh, saves time and money it is still a very long way to go though so uh, i do not expect uh, that uh, in the next 100 years that everything is going to be online so i think that is still going to take a very long way what I like to do very much is to bring a little bit of uh, color in the life of your relative. So usually I can only uh, recommend to, for example, Google a person. You will be surprised how many interesting information you can sometimes find when you just Google a person you're looking for, uh, if it is an obituary or if it is something else. What I also uh, often like to include is going outside and going to the addresses which I have found in uh, the documents and just take a picture of it and uh, see and compare them with old pictures just to see if uh, it still looks like this or if it is if it has changed which is also interesting I also often use maps where I just um, note all the addresses to just see what is the area which uh, where all the people from my family were living. And um, you can also look like into phone books or into old address books, because very interesting in German address books and phone books is that sometimes you can also find their, prof their profession in there. You sometimes can also find not only the phone number, but also the address and uh, even on which floor they were living or in what apartment and i like that very much to see and uh, well at last i also love to look at the social aspects so what for example was a police officer earning during that time or what was uh, a librarian earning or um, how was it to be a secretary during that time so I have already mentioned before the websites uh, from the Catholic and the uh, 
Protestant Church, which is Archeon and Matricula. And of course, uh, you can find lots of documents also on ancestry and family uh, search. And I have done some screenshots. This is how Archeon looks like when you Google the name, you will uh, easily find access to the page. And this page also exists in English, but this unfortunately is the one who costs money. And the other one is Matricula. This you can also uh, Google here. Uh, unfortunately, there is only a German version, um, but therefore you can also find books from Austria or Italy or Luxembourg or Serbia, Slovenia. That's what they actually say. But nevertheless, it always takes a little bit luck to find the right books because not all the books are already online. So that was it actually. I hope I could give you a little bit of an insight into German, uh, German research. And yes, I'm looking forward to your questions. So thank you very much.